which goes much beyond the narrowly conditional and contingent cooperation that the popular approach of social contract theory has made central to contemporary theories of justice in the West. I shall call this aspect of Woods the First the responsibility of power, something I've discussed in some detail in my book, The Idea of Justice. The perspective of non-contractual obligation of people's power and capability is presented powerfully by Gautama Buddha in many documents, but most clearly, I think, in Sutta Nipata. Buddha argues that we have responsibility to animals precisely because of the asymmetry between us, not because of any symmetry that takes us to the need for cooperation, in this case with animals. He argues instead that since we are enormously more powerful, of which there cannot be any doubt, than the other species, that power itself gives us some responsibility towards other species that connects exactly with this asymmetry of power. But the goes on to illustrate the point by an analogy with the responsibility of the mother towards her child. Not because she has given birth to the child, that connection is not invoked in this particular argument in Sutta Nipata. There is room for it elsewhere. But because she can do things to influence the child's life that the child itself cannot do. The mother's reason for helping the child in this line of thinking is not guided by the rewards of cooperation, but precisely from a recognition that she can asymmetrically do things for the child that will make a huge difference to child life and which the child itself cannot do. The mother does not have to seek any mutual benefit, real or imagined, nor seek any as if contract to understand their obligation to the child. This is a point that Gautama, I think, is making. And it is strikingly different from the Hobbesian contractual line of thinking and obligation towards each other that has come to dominate, totally dominate, contemporary theories of justice. The justification here takes the form of arguing that if some action that can be freely undertaken is open to a person, thereby making it feasible, and if the person assesses that the undertaking of that action will create a more just situation in the world, thereby making it justice enhancing, then that is argument enough for the person to consider seriously what he or she should do in view of these recognitions. There can of course be many actions that individually satisfy these dual conditions. We may not, however, be able to undertake all those actions that we understand. The reasoning here is therefore not a demand for immediate and unconditional action whenever two conditions these whenever the two conditions I describe are met, but an argument for acknowledging the obligation in an enlightened way to consider the case for action. The mother's sense of obligation to the infant child not only satisfies the dual condition, but it comes to enjoy a priority over other things that the mother may have reason to do if she was free to undertake them. While it's possible to bring in some social contract-based reasoning in some hugely extended and, I believe, rather artificial form, given the ingenuity of that approach, to work out the case for the mother to consider helping her child some kind of an infinite social contract. Mother helps this child, the child, when it becomes mother helps the next child, and so on. But that, I think, is, is a, is a, is, is, a, is, is really not a very natural way of thinking about it. It would be a much more roundabout way of getting to a conclusion that reasoning from the obligation of power can directly yield. The basic point to recognize here is the existence of different approaches to the pursuit of reasonable behavior, not, not all of which need the parasitic on the advantage-based reasoning of mutually beneficial cooperation. Indeed, cooperative advantage is only one of many reasons 
for doing things for others in this broader perspective. And the totality of reason takes us well beyond the limited approach of the social contact theory. That, in fact, is the point of departure contract, contract with social contract theory in my book, The Idea of Justice. In that, I have argued for recognizing the need for a fundamental departure in the understanding of the concept of justice. A departure not merely from the mainstream theories of justice in contemporary political philosophy, but also from the long tradition in Europe going over several centuries of situating the analysis of justice in the framework of a so-called social contract. The social contract approach was pioneered by Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century, and it has been the strongest influence in the analysis of justice from the 18th century to our own time. The departure I have proposed demands some fairly radical change of focus in the mainstream theories of justice that are dominant at the present time. It also demands, I would argue, some variation in the way we think about our contemporary challenges of public policy, global as well as national. Is there a connection with Buddha's approach? Uh, um, is there a connection to my theory? Indeed there is, as I've discussed in the book, um, I think in some detail. But it's not the only intellectual ancestry, I should make clear, of the understanding of the idea of justice that I'm trying to advance. But there is one source. There are other traditions too, from across the world, on which I draw. But the three particular features of the approach from, derived from Buddha's thought, which I've been outlining here and, and talked about, do fit squarely with the idea of justice I've been trying to explore. This line of reasoning is based on the idea of the social contract. Sorry. This line of reasoning based on the idea of... Sorry. Let's start again. The line of reasoning based on the idea of social contract, the alternative, concentrates on identifying perfectly just social arrangements which the social contract seeks. Taking the characterization of just institutions, so it's an institutional effort, to be the principle and often the only identified task of the theory of justice. This way of feeling justice is woven in different ways around the idea of an imagined social contract, a hypothetical contract that the population of a sovereign state are supposed to be a party to. Major contributions were made in this line of thinking by Thomas Hobbes that I mentioned, John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and, of course, Immanuel Kant, among others. The contractarian approach has become the dominant influence in contemporary philosophy, led by the most prominent political, and I believe the best political philosopher of our time, John Rawls, whose classic book, A Theory of Justice, published in 1971, presents a definitive statement of the social contract approach to justice. I should explain that I differ sharply from it, but um, I'm also very respectful of Rawls, and he learned a lot of political philosophy from him, and I even taught courses together with him, and my book is dedicated to him, though he knew he died by the time the book came out, it was always encouraging me to write the book. But he knew, of course, that I would differ from it. He didn't know that I would dedicate the book to him, because I really learned so much from him in the dialectical way. The principal theories of justice in contemporary political philosophy, coming not only from Rawls, but also from Robert Nozick, Ronald Dworkin, David Gauthier, and others, though distant from each other in specific content, draw in general on the social contract approach and concentrate on the search for ideal social institutions. In contrast, a number of other Enlightenment theorists, beginning with Adam Smith, the Marquis de Condorcet, one of the theorists of the French Revolution, and Mary Wilson Clark, the pioneering feminist, and I believe the most underestimated 
philosopher of all time, and extending later in the 19th century to Karl Marx and John Stuart Mill, among others, they all took a variety of approaches that differed in many respects from each other. I think Marx could not have tolerated any comparison with Mill because he talked very little of him. Mill didn't think very little of Marx because I think he never heard of him. Uh, but even though they differed from each other, they shared a common interest in making comparisons between different ways in which people's lives may go. Jointly influenced by the working of institutions, that's very important in social contract theory, but going beyond, beyond institutions, people's actual behavior, very Buddhist concern, their social interactions, and other factors that significantly impact on what actually happens. Instead of relying on some hypothetical contract to which everyone involved is taken to be, or imagined to be, since it's not real, a party, the alternative approach can concentrate on what agreement can emerge today on the basis of public reasoning, how justice can be enhanced. The idea of justice I've been exploring draws on the dialogic method that was a very prominent part of the priorities also of European Enlightenment. Justice is thus on Buddha's reason-based exploration of ethical obligations 2,000 years before that, that individuals and societies have to recognize. The analytical, and quite frankly rather mathematical, discipline of social choice theory, which had its origin in the works of French mathematicians in the 18th century, in particular the Marquis de Condorcet, but, all, but other, also others like George, Rochal de Borda, which had been revived and reformulated in our own time by Kenneth Arrow, belongs robustly to this alternative line of investigation different from social contract theory. I must confess that I have been very involved myself in the development and use of social choice theory. In fact, uh, my novel to which you kindly referred to along the for the welfare economic but most of the papers cited are, in fact, mathematical papers, social theology. I feel sometimes like an imposter when I read them in the paper saying, now at last the novel is recognizing non-mathematical work, given the fact that pretty much all the papers the cite are quite mathematical. The first one that the cite is called Necessary and Sufficient Condition for Binary Consistency of Majority Decision. doesn't sound particularly non-mathematical. But it's concerned, it's moved, of course, by the same approach that I'm trying to uh, present here. And mathematics has just happened to be a way of making the point. Um, I focus particularly on the exploration of the constructive possibilities of the social choice, social choice approach, different in that respect from Kenneth Arrow's focus on generating impossibility results. And I've been involved over some decades in the derivation and elucidation of the demands of justice with the help of mathematical social choice theory supplemented by general and largely non-mathematical political and moral reasoning. There are three principal departures in the theory of justice I've tried to present in contrast with the social contract approach. First, rather than beginning with asking what is perfect justice, a question in the answer to which I believe there could be very substantial and unreconcilable differences even among very reasonable people. And my point is we don't have to resolve it to decide what would be a justice enhancing thing to do today. We don't have to share the ultimate vision of the universe. Instead of that, I argue for following Condorcet and Adam Smith in asking about the identification of clear cases of injustice on which agreement could emerge on the basis of reasoning. In arguing, for example, for the abolition of slavery in the 18th century world, as the Marquis de Condorcet, Adam Smith, and Mary Wollstonecraft did 